certainly welcome our Facebook friends as well. And boy, I'll tell you, our day started out wonderful with a men's breakfast. And you know what's amazing is what we're trying to do, what we really try to do is, is help you experience something that takes you into maybe a dimension that you haven't experienced before with God, right? In other words, you're not just going to hear something, you're going to hear some scripture and, uh, and, and a little message, and then you go home and it has no effect on you. The, the hope is that you enter into a, a different dimension with the Lord than you've ever been before. That would be the hope. Our men's breakfast started out this morning, and our senior pastor was sharing with us, and, and he was just talking about all the things that God was doing in the new schools that are opening up. Four new ones this fall. And uh, that's amazing. It's a god size project, right? It's huge, and it's amazing, and it's exciting, all of that. And we, so we're, at, we're hearing him share a little bit in, in some of the things that, that God is doing. And I, I really, honestly, hearing him and knowing behind the scenes some of the things that go on, and I get to do logistics behind the scenes of stuff sometimes when God provides and make it happen, uh, all is a routine here that we know as normal at Families of Faith Church. We know those things as normal here. As something comes out of left field and you just need to be ready for it and the Lord's going to make it happen. And you know what I notice that happens is that we count on that as being a reality around here. But that's not reality for a lot of people. A lot of people that come into a church building, they come in and they, they'll hear a preacher uh, preach a message, they might be involved in a Bible study or come to an event. And their experience with God may be limited to uh, hearing that in that particular period of time when they visit or they come to church, and that may be the existence uh, of the, in, in its entirety of your experience. And then there's others that are exploring and they're, maybe they're digging a little deeper. But I would tell you, one of the things that we like to be involved in here on a regular basis is we like to be involved in things that require God to show up or we will fail. Things that require God to show up or we will fail. Because it is impossible to please God without faith. And faith is being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. And so when we get involved in these things that God puts before us, we enter into this relational action that happens as a result of us stepping out based on the calling, what he's called us to do, and stepping out, and then we enter into uh, this dimension that you cannot achieve any other way. It's required that you step out in faith, right? It requires, you know, major adjustments in your life. There's all things that, a lot of things that are part of that. But the relational issue that I want to talk about tonight, it's an amazing thing. Because in this breakfast this morning, I'm hearing this unfold and I'm realizing the people that are sitting here in the, the men's breakfast in the morning time, many are very familiar with God showing up and doing amazing things, providing what could not be provided for. You know, all, all these things have to come together to make something a reality, and then here they are. And so if you go far enough down the road, Brother Randy back there had said, he's been around here long enough, he's seen those things, right? And, and as a result of that, uh, that's something that he's come to expect. This looks crazy, but hold on to your shorts because God's going to show up, amen? And so it's an exciting thing, but realizing that that's something that can only be experienced by us trusting God and entering into what we know as faith. We know as a, a, an action that we do because we trust him, right? So it's our desire here that you would enter into that as well. And so we're doing this study here and uh, experiencing God. We're, come, we're in the second from last week in it, uh, the first group that I've taken through. And uh, and it's, an, it's been an amazing week because every time the same thing happens, I'm so challenged because I'm realizing as I'm getting older that some of the things that are coming out of my mouth are not based on the teaching material in the book, 
as much as they're based on experiential faith from the things in the book. In other words, I teach differently today than I did when I first came to the Lord. Amen? There's something happening, and it's very interesting. There's a Greek word that we were talking about this week. It's koinonia, koinonia, and it means fellowship. It means fellowship. And so that's a word in the church. You hear everything that they do. You know, back in the church, when I first came to know the Lord Jesus, when I asked him to forgive me of my sins, and I, and I asked for what he did on that cross to count for me. I was at this church in Addison. It was a Baptist church, and they had potluck dinners. Who's ever been to one of those? A potluck, right? And some of the youth back then called them potbelly dinners. I think that was more accurate, potbelly dinners. And... Uh, and, it, and they called those things fellowships. Well, they certainly can be, right? It's really, the definition of it would really be uh, sharing in common, communion, partnership, right? Um, and that's something that as we pass a dish around, it, it's centered around an event usually, that they would have a special event, and then you would break bread together, amen? And have this time. But we know that word uh, and it's misused grossly many times. And, and we don't enter into what God has intended for us in not understanding exactly what he wants us to experience because you're never the same when you enter into it. Many people try to do things out of uh, maybe they think it's a good uh, to be busy about things uh, that are helpful to people and so on and so forth. But the reality of it is God wants us to enter into something so much greater. The first time we see in scripture this uh, koinonia is found in the book of Acts in chapter 2. Verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, which is that koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so... Devoted is characterized by loyalty or strong attachment, zealous, deep dedication. That's what they did in the early church. They had this, uh, you know, loyalty, strong attachment, and a zeal and dedication that ran very deep. The apostles' teaching, they, they dedicated themselves to. And, and we know that the apostle Paul uh, was somebody that really rocked the world of, of his peers because he came from the Old Testament culture of the law, and he, of course, got uh, an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and things changed drastically. So something that would summarize up the teachings of the apostle would be the, the apostle Paul himself, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's one of my soapboxes. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, as good as pleasing his perfect will. So fellowship, of course, is our word of the night, is that koinonia, and it's the sharing in common and uh, communion and partnership. And they were involved in that, and uh, they were devoted and loyal, strongly attached to each other. Then they had the breaking of bread and prayer, of course. And the breaking of bread and prayer, we know that, that Jesus himself had the disciples and he broke bread. And we have a picture of the broken body in blood of Jesus, right? Well, they did that and we have uh, a picture there that's amazing. Of They had this communion time, they broke bread and they had prayer time together with all of these other dynamics going on at the same time. And that's the first time that we see this word fellowship show up uh, in, in the scriptures. Of course, what we're talking about there is this intimate relationship these people have. This wasn't, this wasn't like, you know, you have Facebook friends. How, how many of you got more than 100 Facebook friends? Make noise. Yeah? How many more than 200 friends? Make some noise. Make, you can make noise in church. Make some noise. 300 friends. Anybody? Make noise. More than that? Probably a few. Okay. So let me just tell you, they're not your friends. Not all of them, right? Am I right? They're acquaintances, if you'd use the word loosely, wouldn't you not? Is that fair enough to say? 
Yeah. The, there are friends by, that's what they call them when you click them and you accept them and so on. So, but you don't know every one of them. You certainly don't know them intimately. And so this intimate part of it is just really amazing. This intimate bond is, that's koinonia. And it's a place you don't go with everybody. It's a place you arrive at. We know that in the scriptures that John chapter 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that you may know the one and true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay, that's, uh, that's intimacy. That's what, you know, eternal life will be us knowing God completely and fully and knowing Jesus, his son, in a, in a manner in which only they could provide. Amen. And so we're thinking about that kind of relationship. That's not just somebody you click. Believe me, you know, the God of all creation knows every hair on your head. And if you don't have any hair on your head, he knew them when they were there. Amen? He knew you before the foundations of the earth. And so it's not somebody that you just click on that you know maybe just vaguely. Uh, God knows us well. Each one of us, and he wants us to have this relationship that starts with him through the blood of his son, and then carries over through the relational issues of the church, to, this, which is this amazing thing. It's a bond that's not broken that, for years and years and years uh, that runs very deep with us. We are who we are, and we do what we do because of this intimate bond with God and, of course, the body of Christ, the church. So, so there's this amazing thing that happens on the journey where you where this really shows up over time because you know I've had all sorts of uh, over the years differences of opinion with different people inside the church right and I've experienced all sorts of likes and dislikes of personalities and and all those different things but when our senior pastor was speaking this morning and talking about the schools that are going to open and realizing how many people have come together and been part of this koinonia uh, inadvertently without even realizing. Because as they begin to enter into their hand makes this happen, somebody else is doing this. We were talking about desks being picked up from one school uh, that were donated to us. We had to get them out of there in 24 hours. They had to be picked up. All these different things, all these people came into play, and then we're going to be able to see this fall kids sitting in those desks. And there's a richness in that relationship. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And so we're, we're entering into and we're talking about something that's really deep. It's, the, it's a depth that you can't understand. You know, it's like a mother with a child. A mother's love is amazing. Amen? Amen? All right, you guys are going to have to make some noise. Okay? All right, amen. All right, how about this? How about a fellowship in the body of Christ that's, you know, that we love the unlovable. Do you, do you ever do that? You know, we're commanded to love. Do you understand that? Love is a command. And we love the unlovable. But how about this? How about if you're being loved when you're the unlovable? Come on. All right, I hear two, two voices. How about you being loved when you're the unlovable? By the bond of Christ. That's koinonia. That's a deep fellowship that you can't enter in in a secular society, that you perform a certain way or you relate with somebody a certain way or they'll have nothing more to do with you. It's understanding the depth of who we are is because we have a bond in Christ. And the bond in Christ runs so deep because now we're eternally connected. And when we live that out, when we're living in the purpose of that bond, there's something that runs very deep, relational. It runs very deep and we experience something that can't be experienced any other place, you know. And the only thing I could liken it to really is the love of a mother for a child. That, you know, they'll go to whatever extent more than a father will. And, and, and so because they have this love, it's, you know, that, that is just doesn't matter. They're going to stand in the gap. 
And that's what God does with us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because he first loved us. Amen? We love because he first loved us. And so we have this God who so loves us that he pursued us in the middle of our mess out there. He pursues us deeply. And we get hung up on trying to hang on to the mess. How many have been there? Trying to hang on to the mess that you came out of. As that's some kind of identity. He says, no, you've got to scrap all of that. You've got to scrap it because I want to take you to this place. I want to use a word. It's a churchy word. But it wasn't a churchy word. It was a beautiful word. Koinonia. Fellowship. I want to give you a bond that runs so deep that it's going to surpass anything you've ever experienced in your life. And it's going to change you so deeply that who you become is you're going to love the unlovable. And when you're the unlovable, they're going to love you. That's an amazing thing. But you don't get there overnight, folks. You don't get there overnight. It's a journey. Amen? And God gives us all these tools. He gives us the ability maybe to, um, to gauge where we're really at on this journey because we're resistant, aren't we, to what God wants to do? Aren't we resistant to hit? I mean, how many of you like this when you hear this? That love is a command, not a Hallmark card. You hear what I'm telling you? It's a command. We're commanded to love. You know what? The first time I heard a preacher say that, I, I was like, you've got to be hosing me. Because I'm looking around the room, I'm like, I don't love these people. Am I right? Somebody, let, you left. You hear what I'm saying? I don't even like some of them. Are you kidding me? Right? Nobody's making a bit of noise. Am I right? It's a command, and because it's a command, he enters us into something we would not enter in, and as a result, we experience the results of entering into that command. Because at one point in time, somebody loves us. You walk into a church service or you walk into a, a place with Christian people and they extend that love out. They don't even know who you are. And you're on the receiving end of it. And it, sometimes it's at a very key time in your life. And, and it's an experience that's unbelievable. It's because somebody is following suit as exactly what they were instructed. And then you know what happens? The craziest thing happens is as we enter into that in obedience, you know what happens? We enter into it legitimately with our hearts. We have to step out and do exactly what we were told because we don't think that way. Love in our society has terms and conditions to it. Right? 1 John chapter 4 Verse 20 and 21 says this, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And if he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Boy, that's heavy stuff now, isn't it? If we're going to love him, we have to love our brother and sister, right? Well, then the words of Jesus, Jesus said, they'll know you by your love for one another. So what he's saying is you're going to have to have some skin in this game. You hear what I'm telling you? He says, you, you say that you love me, and my expression of love was driven so deeply that Jesus came and died on a cross on your behalf. That's his expression of love to us. Then he says, now go out there and get this world. Tell them that this God in heaven loves them desperately. And show them with your life so it's going to be an invitation. You're going to have to enter into this thing, and you're not going to do it naturally because it's not who you are. So in your natural man's birth, you can't do it. So if you say, you have to be born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and spirit gives birth to spirit. Now the Spirit of God indwells you, and now you have the ability to do what you could not do before. And we enter into a dimension if we're willing to let go of our own agenda and our own ideas, our own prejudice and our own bias, 
and say, God, I want to love with that kind of genuine love, authentic love. I want to be able to be used to you to lead somebody else to the place you brought me. Amen? So this is interesting stuff. But I, but I realized over a period of time, really understanding the, the wickedness of our hearts, you know, that, man, we justify everything, don't we? If we got a foul attitude, we'll tell you why it's foul and why that should be acceptable. Amen, Andy? I mean, amen? Right, brother? Am I right? We do, don't we? Amen. Say it with a loud amen. That's my brother right there. You know what? Let me just say something. Is that, you know what? I'm so proud of watching him grow because the things that we're confronted with in life, they're like a mirror. We're looking straight at it. Amen? And then when God tags you, you're tagged. And the reality of it is, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? And I've watched God do some amazing things in my brother here. When he's confronted and he just responds, I've watched him have to confront and deal with issues where you have to say, hey, listen, I want to love with that kind of love. I want to be that guy. I don't feel like that guy. I don't want to be that guy sometimes. And God, when that ugliness raises up inside of me, I want to confront it. I want, to be, I want that to be met with submission that comes from knowing that I want to represent you because you rescued me. Amen? Amen. The question is, who is your brother or who is your sister? Amen? Let's take it up a notch. Listen to this. Matthew 22 37 through 39 says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Second is likened to the love your neighbor as yourself, right? So, wow. So, our brother and sister, let's just talk about we're supposed to love our neighbors. Who the heck is that? All right, listen. That's a heavy, that, it's getting heavier in here. I mean, I have the body of Christ. I can know these people. I can walk a journey with them. Now the scripture's telling me I got to love my neighbor. Right? Man, I, I was watching a cops episode the other night. It was on in the middle of the night. Man, it was, it, you know what the whole thing was about? It was a whole series of, of little segments about crazy neighbors. It was about crazy neighbors. And all these people, they were cra- there were some crazy folks on there. So we're identifying a neighbor, right? Well, listen to this. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 and following says this. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor. Aren't you excited that that question got asked? Who's my neighbor, right, Andy? Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Let's find, wind this, you know, tighten it up. Because that's a very broad thing. Who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured poured oil and wine, and then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, 
He took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Wow, that's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Well, I'm going to tell you the, the a very broad stroke of the canvas got painted here as to who your neighbor is, right? It's anybody that's breathing air that you have an encounter with, right? And so our conduct to them would be as you've just seen here. Of course, Jesus telling them, go and do likewise. Well, you know what's amazing? First of all, just to paint a picture for you, um, when you think in terms of the one who did the right thing, well, you, you've seen a Levite, you've seen a priest, they did the wrong thing, didn't they? Right? I'll give you a little history right here. Uh, Samaritans are first mentioned in the Bible in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in the 5th century B.C. at the point of Babylon had given away uh, the Persian Empire, Nehemiah, and the Jews equipped with favor of the king and was able to return to Jerusalem to rebuild. However, the Samaritans remained in the land and opposed the rebuilding efforts and caused problems for Nehemiah and his workers. That's found in Nehemiah, the sixth chapter. You see the account of that. Uh, and that began a, a, this long-lasting uh, hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, right? Remember Jesus at the well? I'm going to come down on the floor with you for a minute. Of course, Jesus at the well with the woman at the well. Samaritan woman, amen? The disciples came back and they freaked out that he was with the Samaritan. What the heck is he talking to her for? They would walk around Samaritan. Could you pull me down just a little bit? I'm, I'm just ringing a little bit. So they had issues. And of course, in this story to these very legalistic people, Jesus is answering the question of who is the neighbor, and he picks the hero in the story to be the hated ones. Isn't that amazing? Very Jesus-like, amen? That he was like, you know what, we got a very wicked, wicked generation and we have some very serious heart issues. And uh, so I'm going to paint you a picture because the people that he's speaking to would fit the category of the priest on the wrong side of the road and the Levite following. Amen? Of course, the Samaritan looks at this individual and has pity. And so Jesus says, go and do likewise. You've learned something from those people you hate. Amen? Boy, what an amazing thing. But you know what's so amazing is, you know what, let me just tell you. The Samaritan person, and you hear, you hear us use terms. Once again, we're going to be, we're talking about a churchy term, is the word Samaritan. I mean, uh, Franklin Graham, his, uh, his organization is called Samaritan's Purse, Right? Because we hear of the good Samaritan. It's from the scripture right here. Because in this picture, you hear in the context of a noble thing happening at the hand of a Samaritan. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. Not taking a poke at Franklin Graham or his ministry or anything. Just we know the word based on this scripture without the entirety of the culture of the people. Are you hearing me now? So they were not liked people especially to religious people that thought they were all that in a box of cookies and their whole motive was to trap Jesus. So they're coming at in an attacking way and Jesus uses this story to spin it around and say, look into your own hearts. Because if you see the Samaritan on the road, which side would you walk on? That would be a question that might be a good question to ask, wouldn't it? Well, what I'm wanting to, you know, take you to this place to get you to a hunger for something tonight. Because we look at tasks that we have to involve ourselves in, you know, begrudgingly at times. We, we look at the enormity of, of things that God's doing, 
you know, if you're coming into the church, you're not here very long, and, you, and you're being asked to be involved in things. Well, well because the, the, the workload is enormous to be involved in all these. It's huge. But God is faithful, and he always provides. And we're blessed to be part of what he's doing. What I'm suggesting tonight, though, I'm trying to tickle your interest in entering into koinonia. It's a place called fellowship. It's a place called fellowship that runs so deep that it so motivates you, it becomes something that you can become addicted to, is to see a move of God's hand and to know you're part of it and partake in that with a brother and sister in the Lord. It's not dry religion in a church situation anymore. It's not begrudging, uh, you know, boy, you know, I just need a little time for myself. Don't they know I, you know, I need to have a life? What I'm suggesting is the very words of Jesus when he said the one that wants to save their life will lose it, right? Why? Because it's temporal. And the one that will lose their life for him in the sake of the gospel will find it. You enter into koinonia. You enter into a fellowship that runs so deep and a bond that runs so deep, there's no way you can let go. And it's a bond that goes beyond the walls of this building. Families of Faith is partnering with all sorts of different churches in order to accomplish the education of children that are going to be brought up in the instruction and guidance of the Lord. And so when I think of it, we had, a, we had to cut through some, you know, we had to cut through some religious garbage to get that done. We had to look at it and say, you know, God has a purpose that he wants to accomplish. He wants us to enter into this deep fellowship that's been provided to us because God loved us so much that he sent his son and his death on the cross, us receiving that entered us into an invitation to be part of this koinonia fellowship. So it's not something you can partake in that's some casual thing where you take it or leave it. It's, it's a bond that comes together. When I see what God is doing through the lives of my brothers and sisters, I realize that this picture is way bigger than us. It's way bigger than us that the God of all creation, you know the scriptures that you read that that proclaim these truths, biblical truths, that talk about the enormity of who he is and that he knows us so intimately and personally and that he wants us to enter into relationships in the church that run that deep. Why? Because we accomplish things that the world sees. The world sees. Jesus said they'll know you are my disciples by your love for one another. And you can't fake that love, but you got to enter into it kind of like a shove. You're getting pushed along. It's like a little kid going to picture day at school, right? Her hair is all standing up. Mom's licking her hand and pushing the hair down and shoving the kid into the booth, huh? I remember that's what I got anyway. Yeah, Get in there. Act like you got some sense. Right. Well, now, you know what? looking at some of the things that occurred, I now understand why they occurred. And you know what? And that's what it is in the body of Christ. It's what it is in the church. It's him nurturing us along. But he says, listen, I don't want you to go through the motions on this thing. I want you to own this. I want you to so partake of it that it changes who you are. Not only changes who you are, it changes your relationships, brother to brother, sister to sister, brothers and sisters in the Lord that they run so deep that this is family. It, it, and it's not, you know, people change churches like, you know, they're going to a cinema. I don't like the seats in this. This one reclines and I can bring my soda pop in here. Instead of something so much deeper. Instead of realizing God wants to do something so, so real in our life that we enter into that relationships that he made possible. Amen? We resist them. We resist them with our attitudes and all sorts of different things. 
that hinder us from being able to be used of God. But more than just being used of God, be able to enter into what he really desired for us. You know, I think it's interesting that woman at the well, you know, Samaritan woman, hated by her people, and when she was all fired up because of having an encounter with Jesus, of course she brings all those people back with her. Amen? It's an amazing thing. Do you know, have you ever been at that place? Have you ever been at that place when you're unlovable? Have you ever been unlovable? You've been hurt? You've been something going on in your world. You're unlovable. Maybe you got a wall up of resistance, right? You been there? Drew's been there? I've been there. Listen, I've camped out. I've lived there. That was my address for many times. Sometimes it still is. And I thank God that he's made it possible to be part of something that runs so deep that when I get into that crazy funk in my head, that I break out of it, out of the experience of being part of what he's doing. Are you with me? Are you with me? Am I, am I speaking to the polls? And Drew? Over here too, right? Listen. God wants to make our life full. And it's not the pursuit of all the things that we pursue. It's not the pursuit of the nonsense, the very things that he rescued us out of. It's not finding fulfillment in the temporal things of this world. It's in the abundance of who we are in Christ to enter into this amazing, amazing koinonia. Or you can go through our lives as the church. You can be part of what's going on from a distance, right? And you can have your church relationships be as shallow as those Facebook friends. Am I speaking to somebody right now? You know, everybody's your friend, right? Listen, I, as sure as I'm speaking to you right now, you've got, you might have some good friends, but when push comes to shove, you'll know who's your real friends, right? Amen? Right? Right, okay. Now you're hearing me. But I have watched, I have watched authentic koinonia, I've watched it in the lives of people where they come together. And there is a bond that runs so deep. It is unbelievable. And to enter into it means that we've got to come to the end of ourself. And we've got to actually say, Lord, I, you know, I'm going to take down the walls that I put there because I've been hurt so many times in the past by people, right? Right, I'm going to take those walls down. But I'm not going to be reckless. I'm not going out there in the world with those walls down, no. No, I'm going to nurture my relationship with you, Lord. I'm going to get myself around some really, some godly people. And how, when I say godly people, I mean people who are pursuing the Lord through Bible study and, and, and part of the church. They're not just coming in here and, and you know sitting in a chair and then they're out doing whatever. No, no, no. I'm going to get myself around a circle of people that are, are drawn into what God is doing and they're nurturing their minds in the word, right? Right? Their minds being transformed, right? And as a result of that, I'm going to enter into, I'm going to be actively involved in the work of God. In the work of God. Watching the lives of people change as a direct result of my participation, right? You know, it's interesting because we like to have conversations in our men's devotion, and we cover a lot of ground. One of the things we were talking about was, you know, being yoked together, this unequally yoked, that whole picture. And a yoking, of course, was uh, two beasts of burdens coming together. Uh, and if one, the craziest thing that I heard is the, the craziest pairing up that I heard was a camel and a donkey. Well, that's jacked up. Because the long, one's got real long legs, real powerful animal, the other one's short, and its legs are going like this really fast, and the other one just got this stride going. 
and the guy's got to beat the donkey to death because uh, to get it to try to move with this, it's not going to work. So this yoking thing we were talking about, and, and what does that define? What does that look like? And I'm, and I'm suggesting to be entering into a group to be yoked with some people. You know, incidentally, yoking, yoking is anything, any, any relational uh, situation you're in that hinders um, independent action or movement. That would be, you'd be yoked. So if you're in something you shouldn't be and it hinders you from independently being able to function in the Lord, uh, then you better watch who you're yoking to. Amen? What I'm suggesting is being yoked together with what God's doing. Entering into this depth of this koinonia. The depth of what he wants us to experience that changes who we are with other people. Because as they're on their journey of faith, they're going to bring things to the table and you're going to partake of that meal. You hear what I'm saying? And, and maybe you're having a hard day and they're having a good day. The Lord's doing something amazing and so now I'm being charged up in the fellowship of believers. Amen? The richness of believers. It's not a dry piece of toast. It's a richness that can only be entered in through what it starts with, of course, is a relationship with God through the blood of his son, Jesus, right? Having our relationship with Christ, we receive what he did on the cross. Well, that's the beginning of this journey. But many of us stop there. We never go beyond. We receive the forgiveness that Christ provided at the cross. We receive that. Our name's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we wouldn't know, we wouldn't know Queen O'Neill if it hit us on the side of the head like a bat. Because we resist those relationships and we stay in the relationships of the world. Instead of just taking down the walls. You know, the last song that was played before I came up to preach was Mercy Now. We'll show some mercy to some of the people that you have issues with. How about that? How about you're going to enter into this, this koinonia. You're going to have to say, I'm going to have grace and mercy flowing out of me as well as I'm going to receive it. Why? Because sometimes I'm going to love the person who's unlovable, and sometimes I'm going to be loved when I'm the person that's unlovable. So I want to enter into this existence where I have to tell myself the truth, that sometimes I'm that one. Yeah. Sometimes I'm the pimple in the rear end of progress in what God wants to do, and they still love me anyway. Because he loved me first. Amen? So where are you at tonight? Are you interested? Are you intrigued at all? First of all, when you think of fellowship, do you think of a potluck dinner? Are you, are you intrigued enough to say, you know what, I want to enter into something deeper. I don't want to come to church and have an end when I go out the door and then it's over and then Nothing. I want to be involved in, you know, the time that we're living in is incredible. I was talking to somebody today and just saying, you know what? The, the, the lifestyle of America of a decade ago, that is gone. That's gone. We're here for a time such as this right now. And if you're going to make it through it, let me just tell you, as a believer, if you're concerned at all about walking planet Earth as a light reflecting Jesus, let me tell you, the only way you're making it through it is what I'm talking about right now. The deep fellowship that comes from the body of Christ. You're not doing it on your own. You're not an island. In the world out there, they call themselves your friend. Let me just tell you, when all hell breaks loose, let me gonna tell you this. There's going to be a group that's going to be standing together, and it's going to be koinonia. You hear me? Listen, I've been walking this walk for a long time. And I've been mixed up in crazy whirlwinds of confusion. 
I've been mixed up in delusional thinking at times where the devil's got you against the ropes and you're getting the snot beat out of you. And I've embraced the richness of koinonia. Wow. Wow. An amazing thing that God has the ability to take you in a battered state in an instant revive you. It can happen one way. It's the legitimacy of the journey that's provided because of what Jesus did on that cross. Embracing it in its entirety is to enter into a fellowship that we have walls up, friends. I'm just going to tell you, tonight's the night we break them down. Amen? So I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know if you've ever come to a point to realize, you know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've never asked Jesus to save you, you need to do it tonight. This journey can begin tonight. I've got a brother sitting right over there that just came to know the Lord recently, and he's jumped right into Koinonia. Yeah, crazy. It's awesome. But if you've been walking with the Lord a long time and you've never had the opportunity to know what that really is, fellowship, real fellowship, here's where you find it out. Talk to the Lord about it in this time of invitation. Counselors, if you'd come on up here. We always give an invitation here, give you an opportunity to respond to what God will do in your life if you just say yes. Say, God, I want to. I want to I want to be in, submerged in this fellowship. As the music plays, would you come?
Father God, thank you for this time. God, as we go from this place, I pray that you would stir a hunger in us, that we would crave this fellowship that comes from the richness of what you made possible. Help us as we go from this place not to get swallowed up by all the things that would try to bid for our attention. Help us to stand in the victory that Jesus already won. We thank you, Father God. We pray that you are glorified in everything that has been said. And God, what we intend to do in our hearts. We go from this place. We praise your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.